All right. You, you knew I couldn't do a whole podcast without screwing up some. I, I, you're going to think I'm a boomer, all these guys at home. <laughs> I'm Generation X, I swear. Start from the top. Welcome to this special bonus episode of Bourbon Pursuit. We're all stuck at home during quarantine, so I can't think of a better way to make the time go by faster than bringing a few bonus podcasts to you all. In this episode, we're joined by Aaron Goldfarb. He's a renowned whiskey and cocktail writer, so you've likely come across many of his articles through vinepair.com, esquire.com, Whiskey Advocate, Bourbon Plus, and many more. He has a book out called Hacking Whiskey, and we talk about that later in the show as well. Now, at the beginning of this podcast during that blooper, it sounded pretty good, didn't it? It sounded about normal. Well, it's about to sound a bit muffled because I wasn't paying attention and didn't realize that Aaron was talking into his computer microphone instead of the external one. But don't worry, just a few minutes in, we fix it, and it all gets squared away. Now, make sure that you are subscribed to our Facebook and YouTube channels because we are doing live streams pretty regularly now, and we'd love to have you join us. So enjoy this bonus episode, and remember, keep those hands sanitized. We're all in this together. Cheers. Welcome back to another episode of Bourbon Pursuit, a special COVID-19 edition. Kenny here, and we are talking with somebody that had tried to join us in the last roundtable, but we had some technical difficulties. So I wanted to reintroduce everybody to the man, Aaron Goldfarb. So welcome back, I guess, back to the show. Yeah, I... Uh... I think I might have uh, faked those technical difficulties just because I wanted that one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Uh, you know what? Um, I, I you're gonna make me a little you know, blush a little bit. I appreciate the appreciate the kudos there, but yeah, honestly, we're we're happy to have you. You know, actually, uh, I got a message from Ryan and Fred earlier. They're like, "Hey, are we recording something tonight with Aaron?" And because I just I just put it in our our BP calendar, and Ryan was like, "Man, I, I hurt my back today. I can't make it. I feel so bad." And then. Fred's, Fred's, so everybody probably knows that he's doing live streams every single day at one o'clock and nine o'clock. And uh, he's like, he's like, I can't make it. Just let Aaron know that he's one of my favorite writers. And I was like, it's like, it's okay, guys. Like I can, I think I can handle this on my own. <laughs> like, I don't need the talk, double team. Yeah. But when we start talking about whiskey, I mean, it's, it's, it's an easy way to kind of get going. And so I, I kind of want to, you know, learn more about you. I, I guess, you know, we've, I've read a lot of your stuff before uh, through various media outlets and everything like that. But, you know, I, I we don't really know much about you. Uh, so kind of talk about a little bit like about your entry, like first into journalism and then really what got you into whiskey as well. Yeah. You know, my entry into drinks writing and whiskey is kind of just consistent failure over 20 years. I, I went to film school uh, at Syracuse and I wanted to be a filmmaker I kicked around in the early aughts in, in Manhattan, uh, writing screenplays and trying to make films. That didn't work very well. Um, wrote a few novels. Those worked a little better. Um, but this whole time, like any good writer, I was uh, drinking heavily. <laughs> um, <laughs> Helps you get through the good times and the bad. Right. But unlike the other writers who might have been slugging handles of vodka, I thought, well, you know, there's a better way to get drunk. Um, and, and luckily, you know, I moved to Manhattan in 2001, and that was right as craft beer was emerging. That was right as, you know, the craft cocktail scene was emerging in New York, the epicenter of all places. That was as, you know, bourbon was again becoming hot. You know, Pappy uh, 15 comes out in 2004, I believe, and, you know, you could get it on the shelves for 30 bucks or 50 bucks. And that was a lot of money to me back then. So I didn't buy as much of it as uh, some of my friends that had normal jobs did at the time. But, um, you know, I was very lucky to just be old and growing up at the the, the right time that naturally I, I, I was in all these scenes at the same time. Um, so I developed a knowledge base. I never had any plans to, to write about this stuff. Um, you know, your college counselor, or your high school counselor doesn't say you too can be a whiskey writer when you grow up. Um, you know, maybe they, they say that these days, but they weren't saying that in the late nineties and early two thousands. Um, you know, I think maybe David Wondrich was the only booze writer on planet earth, Michael Jackson, maybe. Um, 
I've heard that name before. I know Fred's talked about Michael Jackson before and everybody wants to think of the pop singer, but no, there was, yeah. there was somebody before that, that, or maybe not before that, but still a, a person in the scene that was writing a lot about, about yeah. whiskey and about cocktails at Absolutely. the time. Yeah. You know, Lou Bryson, I guess was there. He's always been there. Um, but you know, I, I built this knowledge base and then, you know, around the late aughts, the early 2010s, um, now all of a sudden the mainstream publications were realizing, you know, the, these things are red hot and we haven't cultivated any writers that necessarily know about these things. So I was a writer, not a magazine writer or website writer, and I knew these things. And so my first gig ever was for Esquire. I kind of fell backwards into one of the best, you know, in my opinion, publications in, in the history of America. And I, w I was writing beer and whiskey and cocktail stuff for them, you know, from, I don't know, 2008, 2009 on. And then I kind of worked myself backwards and started writing for more niche publications, you know, Punch, Vine Pair, Whiskey Advocate, Bourbon Plus, any, you know, everywhere. I've written for everywhere by now, you know, and I'll, I'm sure I'll be fired from jobs and write for new ones. I mean, it's the life of a freelance writer. You, you take what you get and move on to the next one. That's, and it's interesting to like, just like fall into Esquire. That's like somebody like in my world, just saying like, Oh, I got my first job. It's at Google. Right. You know, it's exactly. like in the, in the tech world. So I think it's, uh, it's really interesting and cool. Like how you're able to do that. So have you been, have you been in Manhattan and New York most of your life or like has, uh, is New York something that are you, you're a home, homeboy of New York, uh, your whole life? No, I kind of have a weird growing up too. I'm, I believe a fifth or sixth generation, um, born in, in New York and I lived there till I was about three or four. And then, you know, this was the early eighties in New York city, which I, I don't know if you've heard, there were some issues. Uh, my, my family moved to Oklahoma city. So along with Fred, I, I would be the second Oklahoman <laughs> regular on here. Um, lived there till high school, then, you know, back to New York since then. And I went to college at Syracuse and upstate New York. And I've been in New York city, uh, now Brooklyn, um, since 2001. And I've been in Brooklyn since 2014. And so you're also in the kind of like the epicenter of what's happening right now with the coronavirus. I mean, especially with, with I shouldn't say the epicenter, that's actually in China, but I'm saying like in America, like where all the eyeballs are on right now, it's like where you're at because it's, it's the most, you know, between you and San Francisco, it's the most densely populated area inside of the United States. And the, you know, the numbers that are coming out and staggering, like I'm assuming that like right now it's, it's, pretty chaotic like you'd be able to just like look out your window and just like just see the rats start scurrying because there's no people out like kind of give us an idea of like what what's life in new york city right now well you know it's funny I, i'm you know I, i've had some professional successes in my life you know books and whatnot and and that doesn't lead to strangers from my past necessarily writing me but this everyone i've ever met in the world who's got my email or or phone number has been messaging me i think i think people assume with all the death and whatnot it's a zombie apocalypse here but um you know i i i go outside every day some days i take a jog there are not a lot of people on the streets um i am in a quieter neighborhood in brooklyn i'm in park slope which is a family-friendly neighborhood but it is it's, you know, a brownstone neighborhood. It's not the sticks by any means. Um, I don't know what it's looking like in Manhattan now. I haven't been there in a month and I'm not sure if I'll be there for another several months. But um, yeah, the streets are empty. Um, there's lines around the block spaced by six feet to get into every supermarket. I go, I go. Especially Trader day. Joe's. Everybody's going crazy for Trader Joe's during this. And it's, it's funny, like you say that, because I've noticed that even our Trader Joe's, there's people like lined outside. So. Well, see, I would never go to Trader Joe's because the the aisle uh, width in, in New York is incredibly tight. So I kind of go to the places where <laughs> I don't want anyone bumping into me, getting close to me. Um, you know, of course, unlike a lot of places, we shop in New York by carrying it home. So I, I go to my, you know, snobby supermarket across the street and I, I put as much as I can possibly carry and I don't even really think that hard about what the week of meals is going to look like. And today my family just ate a, a grilled chicken with, uh, you know, whatever scraps we could also find. Some days we're eating incredibly and others were not. We order delivery about once a week. That's still 
very avid here. Um, if you haven't heard, just about every great cocktail bar is delivering cocktails right now. I haven't done that a lot um, because I have lots of booze myself, as you can see, and I know how to make cocktails, and I'd rather deliver them in not coming to my house both for both of our sakes. But, um, you know, if, if you... <laughs> You know, if I didn't have a family, I, I would just be reading a book a day and writing an article a day and watching a movie every night and drinking some whiskey. And 90 days later, I'd, I'd come out of this. But I'm living in a house with a three-year-old and a newborn and a wife who's on conference calls 10 hours a day for her busy job. Uh, so it's it's very stressful. It's very hectic. I'm outside of this dwelling 30 minutes to an hour a day if I'm lucky. Um and you know that's life right now it's it's for people that are single and alone it's probably lonely and incredibly boring for people with families uh it's it, it's it's probably the most stressed and aggravated and tense i've ever been you know <laughs> so you know i kind of want to get back into your little bit of your your journey into bourbon and your journey into to whiskey like did you have a a sherpa along the way that kind of taught you you know, because I can look behind you into the camera right here and I see a bunch of wild turkeys, decades, you got some knobs, you got, but I mean, you've got more Russell's picks than probably Rare Bird 101. So, why well, buy all of his? <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's, that's part of it too. So, kind of talk about like who was, who's kind of like taught you the ropes? You know, I kind of have a weird Sherpa. It wasn't, you know, an older gentleman, My, uh, you know, a good buddy of mine from college, you know, we were talking about, I was kicking around making, you know, $15,000 a year writing screenplays. No one wanted. He w became a salesman from day one. And, uh, this is my friend, Derek. Um, and, uh, you know, he had a massive expense account, so he didn't know more than me, but, he could afford to learn things on someone else's dime. Uh, and I, and I mean a massive expense account. You can't even guess, guess the number and I won't say it in case there's uh, so in case he listens and his bosses listen. Yeah. Well, he doesn't work there anymore, but in case any litigation is pending, um, no, he, 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 he lived in DC, which, you know, of course at the Jack Rose, we've heard about what's going on with them right now. Um, and we, you know, he'd come to New York a lot for business. And again, this was when the emergence of really great bars in New York were coming, um, you know, Milk and Honey, 1999, Pegu Club, I think that's 2005, um, PDT, 2009. Now, New York's never been a really great whiskey city, to be fair. There's just too many rich people that, you know, if a Jack Rose existed in New York, it wouldn't exist on day two. Um they just got to make their prices even higher than if that's what it takes. You, you literally cannot price trophy bottles high enough in New York to keep them in stock. Um, but anyways, Derek, uh, you know, he'd come to New York and, and we'd just spend silly money trying every cocktail on the menu at PDT, trying any good thing in the house. And, you know, in the, in the aughts in New York city, um, it, it was still a, a wine city. So, you know, things like, Pappy were in George D. Stag and stuff. You you could you know get for a reasonable port twenty dollars a port wasn't reasonable to me back then, but of course it was reasonable to people with money. So you know e even when I wasn't a writer, even when I had absolutely no money, I I tried every every great whiskey released from you know the late nineties on. I never owned any of these bottles till till you know the last decade when I actually started making money. But, you know, I remember when Derek got, I think, a case of Tornado Survivor and just all this stuff. We were we were trying all this stuff. And, I, you know, we were both learning together on on his uh, his company's dime. <laughs> I mean, learn to learn on a case of Tornado. I think that's uh, you're living right or you know the right people. I mean, that's that just kind of gives us the whole thing of like, you know, you never own a boat, but you have a friend that owns the boat. And even better if the friend owns the boat and someone else is paying for it. <laughs> See, there you go. That's that's 10 times better, 10 times better. You know, and there's one thing that you kind of mentioned right there about, you know, trophy bottles like in New York, just being always astronomical and always rocket high. I mean, I'm assuming at this point, like you've given up the chase in regards to finding something around New York, or you've got your local spot, or do you just rely on, as you mentioned earlier, just like buying picks from some of your favorite people in the scene? 
Yeah, well, you know, writers like me um, are lucky. I, I get to at least try everything um, released because because companies send it out. They don't necessarily send full bottles, but Buffalo Trace sends you know the BTEC lineup every year, and you know every company wants you to taste their stuff. Um, and I, I like all that stuff. If I ran into you know George D. Stags or Handies at at reasonable prices, I, I do buy them. Um, but you know, one of my favorite things to drink is is Russell's Reserve picks, and they're fifty bucks. They're sixty bucks. That's what I'm drinking most nights. That's what I was drinking earlier tonight. This is what I'm drinking right now. Oh, there you go, the Bourbon Community Roundtable Internet Friends pick. Perfect. I thought I'd I thought I'd kiss some ass. Um, <laughs> we'll take it. But you know, some of this stuff is is extraordinary. Wilderness Trail is extraordinary right now. And even though I have you know thousand dollar bottles in my house that. I really don't give a crap about them being drained. I'm reaching for Wilderness Trail a lot right now. I'm reaching for Russell's Reserve single barrels almost every single night that I'm drinking. Um, so, you know, I don't I don't know why that's what interests me. You know, Blake said to me, you know, he's drank so much great stuff that he kind of enjoys the rawness of of young young craft whiskey. Um, and I wouldn't say I enjoy that that much. But, you know, Wilderness Trail has a flavor profile you're just not used to. You know, how many more, you know, aged MGPs can you drink? How many more, you know, weeders from Buffalo Trace can you drink? You know, at a certain point, it's fun to try uh, new flavor profiles. And that's one reason I think you're seeing a lot of bourbon geeks get into Armagnac or wine or other stuff. Just because they're bored with with their palates. After you've drank everything, you're you're just like, you know, I need something else to excite me. Yeah, that's true. I think you, uh, I think you bring up a pretty good point too, especially when we talk to a lot of people in the whiskey realm. And I think it was probably what three years ago, maybe two years ago, when this whole like MGP craze just like went a wall. I mean, just it went off the off the rocker, and there were groups that were searching and hunting and just trying to find this, you know, anything over ten year MGP and just clearing out these smaller distilleries that had anything left of it, and people are really hung up on it. And, you know, when they look at even like what we did and starting a whiskey line and saying like, well, why didn't you go MGP? We're like, oh, because everybody else was doing it. Right. And, and I think that's hopefully that's at the point that you, people will start getting that sort of fall- or palate fatigue of trying the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, I think Blake's a little bit of a special character thinking that like, yes, I want young, young raw whiskey. Uh, I'm going to have to see if he going to get that tattooed on his back <laughs> or something like that. But um, I think uh, I think you do bring up a solid point there because there's a lot of not only great values, which you just talked about in the Russell's world, uh, and you get a lot of diversity, uh, especially with those picks. But there's a lot of good stuff coming out from younger distilleries now that are starting. And I think this is, A, why we see the, uh, the plunge of MGP stock, uh, and B, you know, why I think people are going to start changing their their minds here in a little bit because there's been this idea that, oh, like I'm not buying young whiskey. I'm not buying something that's not from Kentucky. And that's, I, I was that person like two years ago, maybe even three years ago. I was that person too. But now like we're starting to get to the point where a lot of these distilleries around the country outside of Kentucky are having products that are four years old that are, they're knockouts. I mean, they're fantastic. And we're going to get to the point here in the next, maybe another two, three years where the shelves are just going to be littered full of just goodies like that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. A a lot of people used to think craft whiskey sucked because it wasn't old enough. And now you have craft whiskey that's, you know, in its second decade and some of it still sucks, which proved that (laughs) the reason it sucked was not because it was young. And then you have wilderness trail and, um, new riff, which are, you know, four or five years and they're, they're incredible. You know, a lot of craft whiskey. I drink one time just to see what it tastes like wilderness trail and new riff. I actually reach for over, you know, the big boys. Um, so, you know, it wasn't age that a lot of these brands that I will not name unless you, you know, get me in a bar, not on your podcast were bad was because they were bad because they were distilled poorly. Cause maybe they were fermented poorly. Cause who knows why? Um, but you know, wilderness trail has, has certainly shown that, uh, youth is not, um, any excuse for not being great. 
So, so you, you know a lot about whiskeys. We, we can get that. We can look behind you. We can read a bunch of your articles about whiskey, but you make a lot of different articles about mezcals and about everything. Like kind of talk about your journey into other spirits. Like it's, it's cool to have your buddy that helped you get into this wonderful world of bourbon that uh, probably spoiled you beyond belief. But then how do you, how do you get into all these other sects of like figuring out, I know you've done stuff on like the perfect martini or uh, stuff like that too. Like kind of talk about like how, how do you get into uh, the realm of doing that as well? Well, (laughs) the cynical answer is I'm a freelance writer and every article I write makes money. So (laughs) (laughs) You, you tell me what to write about. I'm in. Exactly. I'm writing a vodka article right now. I'm sorry, Fred. The pay, <laughs> the pay was good. <laughs> um, but no, you know, I have a theory that guys like us, um, we collected things and we were obsessed with things from day one. I collected baseball cards, comic books, anything. And I collected them as hard as, but I needed full sets. I needed everything. I needed to know every any passion. I needed to know everything. And then, you know, on to the next one. So at a certain point, you don't know everything about whiskey. That's impossible. You're still learning stuff. That's why I think a lot of people have moved backwards towards Dusty's because, you know, once you've kind of mastered the modern whiskey culture, you got to start learning, oh, that distillery produced that. Oh, that's where, you know, you know, Stutzel, whatever. Uh, And then you start moving on to other things and other tastes. Um, You know, as I said, Armagnac has become an inexplicably kind of big amongst, you know, upper echelon geeks. Um, you know, it's just fun. I, I do drink neat whiskey almost every single night. I, I'm I'm not, you know, reaching for other stuff every single night, but I like to learn um other things. Uh you know, I drink a lot of rum. Rum's a, a very weird category, as I'm sure uh if you've read Rum Curious, um you might know. Uh you got know, a book down around here somewhere of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of cool things in rum, you know, I'm my, my quarantine drink of choice has actually been gin cocktails, um, which are fun. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will say that I am a, a, a big fan of gin cocktails. It's just something that is, it's light refreshing as, uh, actually a gimlet is like my number one. That's what I that, always reach for. That's actually my, my wife and I's official cocktail of quarantine, the gimlet. Let's see, we can or, hang out. Uh, it's like, it's like Gatorade in cocktail form. And I'll, I'll tell you, uh, and shout out to New Riff, uh, they've got a barrel aged gin and that's what I've been drinking. And it's really, fantastic. yes, it's fantastic with it. I, I have a bottle of that over there. I, I like their gin, but I've never thought to use a barrel aged gin in my gimlet. All right, tomorrow. There you go. <laughs> We're creating new traditions around here already. Yeah. Um, so no, I, you know, I'm just a fan of everything except vodka actually, but I will write about it. Um, you know, if, if something's interesting, I want to drink it. If something's tasty, I want to eat it. If something's good to read, I want to read it. You know, there's lots of things in this world. I don't just don't understand people that, you know, kind of get stuck in their lanes and don't try to enjoy and learn as much as they can about everything. It's, it's fun to learn things. I mean, that's kind of the most fun thing is, uh, you know, I'm trite like everyone else. I'm also getting into arm and yak and it's fun to start at zero and, you know, after a year ago, oh, I kind of know a little about Armagnac. I could, I could tell someone about that. Oh, I know a little bit about Mezcal. I don't know a lot about Mezcal. You know, that article you're referencing, we did a blind tasting with two bona fide experts. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I have a pretty good palate, so I can say what I think is good and bad, but I can't tell you about, you know, the varietals of agave or, you know, why this one tastes like this or where this grew or, you know, the different ways of fermentation, but they knew all that. You know, and it's inspiring to think, oh, well, I could learn all that. You know, bourbon kind of really only has one way to make it. Uh, mezcal has infinite. You know, rum has so many, um, just lots of stuff to learn and, and so little time, except now when we're all sitting home. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're like a, a leech of information is the, what it comes down to because you, you're able to kind of just talk to a lot of these people that are really, you know, really know-it-alls in this world and just kind of really – take their story and harness it and develop something that is appealing to a visual reader. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'll never convince my parents that the most fun thing about writing about alcohol is, is actually getting free educations, not free booze, but you know, it's, it's really great. You know, some of my story ideas are literally like, you know, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. And, you know, 
it's it's like a con game. I can reach out to the most important person on the topic and they're going to talk to me. If you're an average Joe off the street and you email the most important, you know, Armagnac maker or gin distiller and said, can I talk to you for an hour? They'd be like, uh, no, you know, but, why, <laughs> but you know, they'll move mountains to, to talk to me just cause I, I will write about them. So, you know, it's, it's not just a way to pay the bills. It's not just a way to get free drinks. It's, it's, it's a free education on topics that interest me. And, you know, after over a decade of this stuff, it, I still have a passion for it all. And so when we get back to like a whiskey article, is there one that you've written over the years that you look back and you think like, man, I loved writing that one. Like, was it, you know, was it the person? Was it the, uh, was it the whiskey? Like, what was it that, that really like drove you for that article? You know, my favorite articles are kind of goofier, dumber, less prestigious ones. Um, I mean, I will admit like the one you did with, uh, what was it? Janae? Yeah, Janae. And she made that that ridiculous uh, old fashioned way back in the day that went viral. And you kind of said like, all right, where's she now? Sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, those are my favorite to write. Um, you know, I can, I can write a, you know, <laughs> interview with the distiller or an article on how a whiskey's made, you know, in my sleep. But, you know, the, the kind of weird ones, one of my favorite articles I wrote for Punch probably four or five years ago was the history of when it became very trendy in New York and Miami for um, bars to have beds in them, literal beds in them. Um, and those stories are very, always very hard to report. You know, if you, if you want to write a story about, you know, a, a distillery today, it's very easy to get these people on the phone to talk to you. They'll talk to you all day. But if you, you know, I, I wrote a history of, of foam parties a few weeks ago for Vine Pair. How the hell do you find a guy in the 90s who decided, you know, we should blast foam into these Ibiza nightclubs? It's not easy. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I could write a lot easier stories. I could write, you know, what we call listicles, top 10 whiskeys and, and you know, get paid and work for an hour. But, you know, I, I just have a passion for finding these really stupid weirdo stories and and bringing them to you i just had flashbacks of like panama city beach florida Excellent. spring break that's just what happened right there <laughs> uh, i can't wait to read that article when it comes out so I, you know there's another thing that you'd mentioned right there about like top 10 lists and it seems like that is that seems to be a driver for a lot of a lot of articles it seems that I mean, it could be articles, it could be YouTube videos, it's anything, anything that has a top whatever, it just drives people to it. I mean, do you have like a love-hate relationship with it? Yeah, I mean, you know, every time a, you know, Esquire, GQ, you know, best whiskeys to drink right now, 10 best whatever lists come out, you know, I, I see the Facebook comments. I'm not saying articles written by me, articles written by anyone. And people presume they're, you know, the the brand paid for them or whatnot. Um, it's, it's not that insidious, but you know, it's, it's kind of like an ecosystem, you know, the, the brand hires a publicist and pays them. The publicist send bottles to a writer, the writer drinks the bottle. The writer wants to keep the publicist happy. The publishing company asks for a top 10 whiskeys list. They publish the last 10 whiskeys, the last 10 publicists they like sent to them rinse repeat. So I don't really like that stuff. Um, Publicists probably hate me more than most writers in New York because, you know, I'm kind of bitchy and I, <laughs> I don't play those games. But, you know, every writer on planet Earth writes listicles, whether it's David Wondrich or, you know, whoever, um, you know, they pay the bills. They have good SAO. Everyone argues about them. Um, it doesn't matter what website it is. If you write the top 10 whiskeys right now, it'll do pretty well for the day. Um, I, I try to write those as little as possible. They do not interest me. Um, if I'm doing those kind of lists, I try to make them interesting. I did a, um, about every year or two, I, I try to pick the best whiskey in every state for Esquire. Um, that'll keep you busy drinking. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And you know, people get furious. That's not North Dakota's best whiskey. How has this guy ever tasted? Blah, blah, blah. And the answer is probably no. I've tasted maybe one or two whiskeys, but I'm trying my damnedest, unlike a lot of writers who are listing, you know, the, as I said, the last 10 whiskeys they've got in the mail. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it can be very tough to be thoughtful in this industry when a lot of um, 
you know, guys like me or girls like me that get paid to do it can kind of just phone it in, you know, the amateurs actually put more work in it because they're doing it for a passion, not to make money. So, you know, whiskey blogs are some of the best, smartest out there. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of professional websites and magazines, it was just, you know, Hey, could you write this over the next hour? Well, I don't know anything about vodka. Okay. Well, write it, <laughs> <laughs> go to the store, get five bottles, review it, come up with a list. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that something that in the writing world, I, I mean, I, I guess I can kind of even picture it in my own world where at very beginning of my career, like I was gung ho and I was trying to cut my teeth doing grunt work and trying to, uh, you know, doing a lot of like, like really hard kind of IT stuff and like working insane kind of hours. And then at some point you're just like, okay, give it up. I'll focus on what I'm good at. And then, you know, kind of just like let the professionalism take off from there. I guess in like the growth pattern of what a writer is like is, does it kind of have that same sort of trajectory or, or path in regards of, you know, you start off early, as you kind of mentioned, as an amateur trying to like write a top 10 list. And then you're like, okay, I'm done with that. Like, I'm going to try to find something more interesting. Well, I mean, food and drink writing is unlike any other, you know, we're, we're so close to the subjects, you know, we, we, have friendship with bartenders and distillers and whatnot. Um, and if we weren't doing it, we'd still, you know, drink these things and go to these bars. I, I don't think anyone would, you know, <laughs> hang out with politicians if, if they weren't a political reporter, um, you know, and there's, you know, the famous thing that just you know, sports writers hate sports by the time they've been a sports writer so long. Um, yeah. You know, when you're early on trying to break into writing and it's probably different now, um, or maybe it's even tougher now, you, you'll you'll take anything someone gives you. It just seems like so hard to get paid a literal dollar to 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 write something. So it's less early on for a lot of these writers, and I notice it amongst younger younger writers right now about finding your voice and trying to do in, anything interesting, and more letting you know the sites dictate you. And the funny thing is, if you came to these sites as a or magazines or newspapers as a 22 year old with these outlandish ideas, with these crazy ideas, with these ideas that no one else is writing, you'd probably have a better chance of selling it. You'd probably have a better chance of making uh, good money. Um, and, and, you know, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. And figure out exactly like, Oh, you're going to pay me more. I'm going to go over this way. Yeah. Wait, I'm going to give rare bird a shout out. Yeah. Go for it. David's a good friend of the show. So he's uh and I, and I can see you've got all, you've got a lot of his the, turkey the picks over the there. Okay. Yeah. So wrestle the muscle there. So fantastic. So I guess a, another question is, is that, you know, once you start getting into this world and yeah, I, I can always understand as a writer, you have to be conscious of, uh, you know, where the money's coming from. And so that's what you focus on, but is there something about whiskey that keeps you intrigued or keeps you kind of always tied to it? Um, Wh or like what is it or what is it about whiskey or bourbon that like keeps you wanting to come back for more <laughs> well the one thing i don't write a lot about is wine and i never really understood why i don't dislike wine i'm not a connoisseur and then i realized and i said to my um editor at punch uh, talia i just don't find wine funny <laughs> but whiskey is so funny uh and if you've read a lot of my stuff it's about you know secondary markets it's about turkey dues. It's about, you know, California gold. It's about infinity bottles. It's about, you know, geeks lining up at Jack Rose, uh, even though, you know, there's a pandemic, you know, there's just so many funny characters. The distillers aren't necessarily funny characters. They're characters, but they're not necessarily funny characters. But the 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 collectors, the 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 people that drink it and pursue it and and the people that listen to podcasts about right. it. They're just funny characters. And I'm, pro I'm probably a funny character too. Look, I, I live in a, a 1,200 square foot a, apartment with two children and I got an entire room of whiskey. That's 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 not, not probably a good use of space. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it just – it it infinitely cracks me up to to go on the internet every day and, and – <laughs> just see what whiskey geeks are talking about and doing and drinking and trading and arguing about and memeing and all that stuff. And maybe one day it won't, but uh, it's it's really funny to me. And, you know, if you're writing a booze story and there's not something funny about it, it just doesn't interest me that much. 
That's true. Uh, there are some of the good memes that that come out of whiskey and come out of bourbon, uh, especially you know, and even in those secondary markets where people get butt hurt, and then you've got the uh, the other groups where there's people that basically have court hearings about you know stuff like that. I'm kind of like, what at what other point would people just have this like fake court system over a transaction of bourbon that happened on the black market? Like, <laughs> it's just it's comical. Yeah, I mean, you know, my like career like ethos has been trying to explain this weird world to like normal human beings like no you you first of all you have to know like 10,000 acronyms um <laughs> yep it, yeah i always i always thought that there would be like a good t-shirt like just full of acronyms like everywhere yeah you have to have like a stock market ticker in your head what pappy 23 P, pvw 23 is now worth 19,000 you idiot <laughs> ben <laughs> You just have to, I mean, you have to know, like, if I don't pay attention for a week, I come back and I, I'm, I'm, I'm messaging my friend Derek, who's still locked in on it. I'm like, what the hell's going on with this? Is that a real thing? You know, is this, is this will at box club a real thing? you know, <laughs> <laughs> that was, I'll tell you what, that's been one of the greatest uh, recent ones when it's, it, you can just tell the, the OGs versus the new people that are into it. They're like, where's the sign up button? I don't see it. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's also really funny to see, you know, it drives me nuts because, you know, even though I said, you know, from the get go, I was trying very good stuff. I still, you know, paid my dues and spent money on regular makers, Mark and OGD and stuff. And and these guys who were, you know, not even drinkers last week are, you know, thinking they can just go from like nothing to bawling out with, you know, George D. Stagg or whatnot. It's like, you know, slow down train your palate start with the 80 proof let's uh let's get you up to uh this level i will say that it is uh that is like one of the sh- the corner cuts that you or you know corners that you can cut here in the in the whiskey world is that if you come with a big enough checkbook you could have one of the best collections that that are out there uh, in bourbon you know because it's still a you know especially in regards of what scotch prices and everything like that are whiskey prices even pappy 23 at 18 1900 a bottle that's that's a drop in the bucket for what some scotches go for. So if you come with a big enough checkbook, you could have one of the most insane bourbon collections that are out there just by buying directly off the secondary. Yeah, that's why it cracks me up, you know, every so often there's, you know, well, constantly there's how do I get Pappy Post? Have money? I mean, it's not hard. <laughs> um, you know, my a friend of mine, Alex Bachman, he, he, I think he still does. He used to um, fill bars with, with, with spirits that was his job to find you know a new bar opens and they want the you know most sick list he'd fill them up and you know everyone oh we, we got the full pappy collection well just give him ten thousand dollars and he can do that it's not very hard what's hard is finding 1960s amaro what's hard is finding you know 1950s stitzel weller what's hard is finding you know obscure scotches you've never heard of or japanese releases of you know whatever that's hard buying you know Van Winkle or BTAC that comes out every single year, you just need market rate money. And again, it's not that much. You're right. I know you've written on the secondary market, but I want to kind of get your idea of like, where where is your stance on it in regards of how it was taken down or how it was kind of like ripped out? Like, was it, is it a good thing for distilleries? Is it bad for the overall ecosystem of bourbon? Like, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, you know, I used to say I was a free market capitalist. Now I'm stuck in a pandemic. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, you know, you don't really see the secondary market for new scotch. And why is that? It's because it's priced correctly. Um, a lot of bourbon is not priced correctly by the distilleries because um, they want to be the good guys who, you know, 20 years ago, there was no such thing as bourbon that cost more than $50. And, you know, Blanton's, you know, in the 90s didn't sell for $30. So they remember that time. And they remember that time as bourbon being an every man's drink. And so they don't want to charge what it should cost. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very friendly with Buffalo Trace, but I don't think, you know, releasing their press release every single year and saying MSRP, Pappy, $15, $80 or whatever it is. I don't know what it is right now. I, I don't think that makes him look like a good guy. It just makes everyone else fight over what the accurate price is. Um, so I don't begrudge anyone for charging what they charge. I don't begrudge anyone for paying what they pay. Um, 
and I think it's kind of ridiculous that the, the distilleries get mad at so-called gouging. Well, they should price it what it's priced because no one's bought an $80 Pappy in you know, a million years unless they live in a control state, I suppose, and won a lottery, which is likewise absurd. These places would <laughs> these places would need lotteries if it was priced correctly. Um, so no, you know, I I think the 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 online secondary market does the job that the distilleries didn't do, and that everyone's mad at the liquor stores for trying to do. Do you think that this is also a play by some of the distilleries to say, well? let's look at the long game here. Let's not try to make a quick buck off of it and price it at the market instead. And you, and you know that you've seen pretty much every distillery is putting in multi-million dollar expansions into everything. And so they're betting on this on the long term. And it's, it's the Amazon model, right? It's, it's like, let's, let's do, you know, massive scale and not try to do, you know, just short bursts of, of high volume. Yeah. You know, that that's true and that's that's a, a fine way to work um you know how many total van winkles are released a year 80 to 100,000 compared to how many buffalo trace eagle rare whatever so you know how much of a money maker is it for them whether it's priced correctly or priced at whatever they want to call the msrp yeah i i think that's a fine strategy and i guess honestly buffalo trace is maybe the only distillery that has to deal with that four roses one release a year old forester one release a year you know all these places with one release a year um have to figure out what it what it should cost so you know if if that's what they want to do i i I think that's fine It, it feels a little hypocritical for them to price it at you know a very low msrp and then get mad at people for pricing it at the correct one i likewise think it's silly for um liquor stores though to you know proudly put up their george t stag for nine hundred dollars it's like you know i i think you have better goodwill if you sold it to your best customer for ninety dollars i think you'd have better goodwill if you figured out a way to get it to a true lover for ninety dollars instead of making that extra three or four hundred dollars um but you know i I, people (laughs) economists aren't necessarily opening liquor stores so uh (laughs) that's that's for sure. That's, yeah, that's true. Everyone's trying to figure out uh, what works best for them and and uh, pays the bills. Well, I think the moral of the story there is that every other distillery needs to just come out with more special releases. Because if you do that, then they, they just keep following that same exact trail. Every release should be a special release, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Every bottle is a special bottle. Yeah. And so I want to just kind of like go back to like one of your stories real quick because you had mentioned the California gold stuff. And, and I know – the person that makes that uh, he's a good friend of mine and i know that when you write stuff and whether it be about secondary whether it be about something like that you might get a lot of blowback uh, catch a lot of flack online like have you ever like felt like oh god like people are really attacking me over something like this yeah i mean you know if you're a writer on the internet you get called an idiot every day of your life um but or if you feel like you're exposing Fight Club or something. Well, you know, it's tough because, you know, I'm both a part of the hobby. I enjoy drinking these things and I don't want to ruin the hobby, but I'm also looking for interesting stories. And after writing these stories for years, it's impossible to ruin the hobby. Um, California Gold was, again, something I drank at my friend Derek's house. Uh, and for a year or two, I was like, you got to get me in touch with our friend. Um and you know he's he didn't want he didn't want press and then for whatever day one he said okay i'll talk to you and um my daughter was a newborn then and it was about the worst behave she's ever been and i i was conducting this really tough score of an interview while she was just losing her shit and um yeah it, it did very well and <laughs> now people i see a, a story came out and can't even remember a, a literal magazine citing California gold the other day. And it didn't even, it, it acted like everyone knew what that was. It was very weird, but I've become friends with Mr. California gold. Uh, uh, we talk occasionally. Um, he's always got interesting takes on things. Um, and I think it's great, even though most of the commenters under Facebook will say it's not that good. 
<laughs> well, most of the commenters are probably the ones that never actually got a chance to try it. And that's what it comes down okay. to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so joke's on you with that one. Can whiskey also. Oh, yes. Yes. Make sure. Talk about hacking whiskey real quick. I want to give you a plug for that. Sorry for the shameless plug. No, yeah, please do. This is actually a perfect book for this time. Uh, came out in 2008, uh, 18. Um, has a lot of my funny stories uh, like California Gold, uh, Infinity Bottles. I think, I think I'm the first person to write about Infinity Bottles. Maybe the second. I don't know. Um, but it, it, it's really funny, geeky stories plus experiments you can do from – Home blends, um, like, uh, you know, Travis Hill's, uh, um, the four roses thing. Yeah. Yep. Barrel proof, uh, yellow label. Yeah. Really fun. You acquire every single four roses and make a barrel proof, uh, yellow label. I know um, he did that. And he also tried to do, uh, creating his own, mir- uh, mir- mirages or marriages or whatever they're called. Oh, uh, yeah, basically yeah. Looking at all the small batch limited edition selects and then actually trying to go and find, those exact age ranges and try to do the Crazy. percentages and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I wrote about, yeah, I, I wrote a punch article about that too, uh, where Blake mentions that he likes to Vitamix his blends cause it <laughs> puts them together and people were furious about that. Um, but yeah, there's fun experiments, fat washing, which is infusing, you know, meats and butters and stuff into whiskey for cocktail, smoking cocktails, um, making foods out of whiskey. It's a, it's a very fun book. If you're stuck inside with nothing to do, except a lot of whiskey and how am I going to use this for everything I'm going to do for the next 90 days? Um, a lot of fun experiments. There you go. Find it on Amazon. I'm guessing. Yes. (laughs) Like everything else. And they're still delivering. So you don't have an excuse. Go buy hacking whiskey. Order it right now. It'll be there tomorrow. Well, you know, Aaron, I want to, you know, like I said, this is a really good opportunity to kind of catch up talk about more, I guess, more about you, uh, your writing career, and uh, as well as just talk about whiskey in general and kind of get an update on what's happening inside of New York. So it's been a pleasure getting to talk to you this time. Yeah, it was fun. We uh, didn't have any kids run in and yell at me. Um, technically, yeah, yeah, it worked same out here. fine. I, I, could hurt, I, heard, I heard him a little bit in the background. So yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll clean yeah. a little bit in post, but yeah, it turned out great. I, I think the biggest technical difficulty is my quarantine beard. <laughs> are you growing it out until you uh until you can walk outside and and shake hands with somebody again or until my wife divorces me <laughs> whichever one comes first right. no a day well, before whichever one comes first there you go keep that razor handy then yeah i will <laughs> well aaron that was awesome talking to you uh if anybody like wants to get in contact with you uh or wants to you know follow you on social media how are they going to do that um, if they want to yell offensive things at me, Twitter's fine at Aaron Goldfarb, um, also at Aaron Goldfarb on Instagram. Um, and you can probably figure out my email address too. If you want to send me crazy tips about blends you're making or weirdo stuff going on in the secondary market that I can turn into a story and get everyone mad at me for ruining bourbon. I guess that's another thing is like, do you, do you actually search Instagram to be like, oh, that's interesting. Like I could write an article about that. Like, is that, are there ideas that pop up like that? Yeah. Like, like most human beings on planet earth, when I have nothing to do, I'm looking down at my phone, looking at Instagram, not necessarily whiskey stories, but you know, Joe, there's just so many bottles out there and things so quickly become hot. You're like, why is this cool guy making a big deal about something that, what is this? Um, and I usually ask Derek, I say, what is that? <laughs> but, um, uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you see weird stuff on Instagram and you file it away. I usually screenshot it to pay attention to it. Cause I'm usually looking at Instagram late at night after a few and the next day I go, oh, is that something? And you know, if you see it happen a few more times, okay, now you got a trend. Let's follow this, see what's going on. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good place to find stories. See, you can get, get inspiration from anywhere then. Anywhere. Just, well, yeah. When you're in the house, the only place you can get inspiration from is your phone. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, awesome. So, Aaron, thank you again for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. Uh, Make sure you go. You follow Aaron on all those social media channels. You can follow Bourbon Pursuit as well. And we'll see you next week.